Thank you also to everybody watching on stream. Um, the BAFTA Games Lecture aims to deliver valuable insights into the creative minds, some of the best creative minds in the video games industry and beyond. Um, it gives people the opportunity to share their experiences as well as their personal vision for the direction that the industry is going in. Uh, my name is Keza McDonald. I'm the editor of Kotaku UK, but we are not here to see me. Uh, we're here to see Dan Hay. So Dan Hay is um, Ubisoft Montreal's executive producer and creative director. Um, he's well known for working on the Far Cry series. Over his career, he has worked as a modeler, a texture artist, an animator, obviously a producer. He's been in games since 2003 and has spent six years with Ubisoft working on the Far Cry series. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dan. Okay, it's a big room. It's a little bit more intimidating when you guys are all here. Okay, so read it in reality how the real world can make your creativity soar. That's what I'm talking about today. And there's a few caveats before I get started, which I want to talk about. Four things, basically. Number one, thank you for having me here. It's super cool. Uh, this is a really interesting thing to be able to do, and I want to say thank you to BAFTA and all of you for inviting me here. This is great, so thanks. Number two, it's important to understand these are just my thoughts. This is not a prescription. This is not a recipe. This is just stuff that I'm thinking. Take the parts you like, throw the parts you don't. That's how this goes. I don't want to talk about just game systems. I also want to talk about all the things that kind of surround it in terms of creative and building characters and building moments and just building an experience. And lastly, I swear. <laughs> Sorry, it's gonna happen. So, using the real world to fuel your vision. And it's interesting because I want to break it down into three parts. First. Vision fuel, what is it, how do you find it, how do you mine it, how do you weaponize it, how do you turn it into what you need, and then a process, a process that I use that you might want to be able to use, or elements that you can use. And finally, I want to actually try and put it into practice, because what I dislike is sometimes folks will get up, and they'll give you your thoughts, their thoughts, and then basically they'll walk off, and you can't test it. So I'm going to actually try and test it at the end, and we're going to see how it goes. It could go crazy. Okay, so first, the vision fuel. I get asked a lot, where do you get the inspiration for a game? And it's kind of a strange question, because to be honest, and this is a little cheesy to say, it's everywhere. It's everybody that you meet. It's every moment that you have. So to be able to understand the nature of this question, I, I went online and I took a look at what people think creative is. And apparently it involves light bulbs and <laughs> colors. Uh, crayons are a big thing, and rainbows. Uh, gears. I don't understand. These gears aren't actually hooked up to anything. They're just colorful. I don't think it does. I don't know what the fuck this is. <laughs> so I'm looking at it. What I think people think is that there's just this creative brain, and you kind of squeeze it, and all this cool shit comes out, and then the money falls. <laughs> and I don't think that's the way it is at all. For me, this is not that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a system or a process or a methodology where you can look at things differently. You can look at the world differently. And you can use it to fuel your vision. So, bringing the idea and the money, how close are they? Well, to me, they're pretty far apart. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes in between. And let me explain. There's you, and there's what you already know. There's the real world. There's a ton of stuff that you can data mine. There's the idea and how you transfer it into the vision. There's the team, because you can't do this alone. You've got to surround yourself with smart people. There's the idea of iteration. There's feedback. There's the pitch, which can be really daunting. And there's a sound that I'm going to talk about that I hate with the heat of a Nova. Okay, and re remember that. This sound drives me nuts. It's creative kryptonite. Okay, and then there's the player. You can't forget about the player, and then finally we get to the money. So, first, leveraging what you already know. And sometimes when I think about creative, I think sometimes we make it overly complex, and we forget that we know a lot of this stuff. This is you, this is me, this is us, and we are a remarkable piece of hardware. We've got thousands of years of programming built into us. And what I'm talking about is evolution, an evolution that actually gives you instincts, which we can leverage as we build our stories. The instinct born from nature, something as simple as saving your life. I think we've probably all been in situations where we get that feeling in the back of our neck, hair goes up in the back of your neck, and you're like, I need to get the hell out of here. That's instinct talking. Also, it fuels your sense of competition. 
it can kind of almost put you into predator mode. It's been governing our behavior before we even realized what we were. What I'm talking about here is it gives us purpose. And the idea of falling in love, the idea of coveting, the idea of wanting to be with somebody gives us a sense of community, that we huddle together in the dark, that we long for companionship. And it gives us a sense of competition. Now, some people look at this and go, yeah, but we've come really far. I would argue that we haven't. I would argue that we still focus on purpose, that even though we've changed, our community has moved online, it's still very much rooted in that need, and we are absolutely fucking lutely competitive. There's no question. It shapes the perception of our world. You think about those early lessons, the first time we saw blood, and we understand its value as both life and death. The first time we saw fire and understood that it could be defense, but it also hurt us. The first time that we saw the forbidden fruit and the color of that, and we coveted it, but we knew that it was dangerous. What's interesting about these colors, these swatches, is that they paint our world today, and we don't even realize it. So it begs a question. If humanity is leveraging nature, why wouldn't we leverage human nature? In the games that we make, in the stories that we tell, in the things that we put on television, in the movies we make. I'll give you an example. You're an audio designer, and you say, I want to make this evocative sound. I want people to feel it. OK, well, you could build this brand new sound, or you could just leverage what we already get two points on our blood pressure from. Every time I'm driving and I hear the sound of a cop car, my heart starts to beat. I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, I'm probably speeding. That's not true. But <laughs> I instantly feel like, oh, shit. I feel that, oh, shit feeling. And so why wouldn't we leverage that? Why wouldn't we use what we already have? Number two, maybe somebody wants to build a stressful situation. The sun is about to burn out, and we have to restart it. The moon is about to crash into the earth. OK, that's certainly a way you could start your story. Or you could just pick something that's relatable. I flew here. I'm terrified of flying. I had to go through customs. I think everybody here has probably gone through customs. And I, I actually went, and I really feel like a little bit weird whenever I put my bag in front of somebody, and, I, and this institution starts going through it. I'm not a drug dealer. I don't have drugs in my bag, but I swear to God, I checked my bag four times for drugs. <laughs> I don't understand why, but I just felt the pressure that I needed to. And finally, I want the player to risk. There's this huge mountain out there, and I want the player to climb it. I want them to risk. I want them to feel it in their bones. That's OK. You can do that. You can do expensive things, or you can do something that we all feel, that we could feel tonight, that we could feel tomorrow. You could just make an alleyway and make it dark and make the sound of a pop bottle moving in the distance. And you get all that stuff for free, all the stuff that we're already afraid of, all the stuff that we already know. Perception and intuition is something that you leverage in the blink of an eye. I'm saying it's this fast. You can take a look at a picture, and it tells you who you trust or distrust in one millisecond. It can tell you that somebody is celebrating or they're in pain. And it can tell you that you need to intervene now. Don't wait. We want to leverage that. But what's interesting about this hardware is that it also comes with software updates. And what I'm talking about is your family, right? Family is an amazing thing because it is both, can be both positive and negative. It's where you first learn about love. It's for where you first learn about yourself. It's where you first understand the value of family and community. And everybody needs that one person in their life that thinks they're special and where you're safe. And that's where you get that from your family. But there's also the negative side of that. We have brothers and sisters that don't like each other. There's competition. And there's a simple question. What if you know that you're not the favorite kid of one of your parents? That is tough information to carry with you through life. We leverage that as we build our characters. When I'm working on Far Cry, I like to think of, yes, of course, we're going to be building villains. We do a pretty good job of that. But I want them to be human. We want them to be human. So we look to that as we build these characters. We look to family. We look to reasonable experience. And we look to the idea of what comes in their past. And I like to do a little exercise. I like to actually think of our villains and our characters sitting around a holiday dinner. Because when you're sitting around a holiday dinner, past the salt never means past the salt. <laughs> it's why don't you love me? Why do you like Jeremy more? How come you won't buy me a car? Don't you understand me? I hate you. <laughs> so we put that into our characters, and we try and make them feel real. Then we have things like culture. 
And what's amazing about this is that we all have these rich cultures. We all have these opportunities. But sometimes people are actually shy about it. I say, why be? It's a fantastic opportunity to share this and give it uh, something that's exotic, something that's different, and make that part of your theme. Or education. We all go after different things. We all covet different things. We chase different parts of knowledge. Use your education as part of your theme. The media bombards us with information, and we react to it, and we take it in, and we choose what we like and what we don't like. Politics, sometimes a difficult subject. People believe certain things, they trust certain things, and they believe it in their bones. Religion, or even just spirituality, a great opportunity for a theme and what you're making and what you're doing. And finally, your basic concept of human rights. Not everybody agrees on all this stuff, and it's a fantastic opportunity for you to leverage what you already know and what makes you unique. We want to leverage what you believe, what you know, what you fear, what you love, aspire, what you keep secret, what you don't tell people. All of these things are fantastic things for you to build your creative with. These are your themes. And your themes inform your ideas. So what I like to do whenever I'm thinking about a theme or I'm kind of data mining my own brain for this stuff is I like to build a collage. Now, you can build a collage in your mind or you can do it at your house. Just be careful who you invite over, because you look like a serial killer when you do it. <laughs> and what it is, it's this. And it creates a swatch. And this stuff is gold. This allows you to see everything you're thinking, and it allows you to cut the fat off it and be able to pull it down so that it's that bare bones elixir. OK. So I have an idea. But how do I grow it into a vision? Well, what I would say at that point is invest in data mining the real world. Look at what's out there. Take a look around. When we're on Far Cry, one of the things we say is reality is far stranger than fiction. And I would argue that the last two years have proven that. I think you have this idea, or you even have a construct of an idea. And you look to, how do I furnish it? How do I grow it? And the answer is, study. Do the work. Put the hours in. Do everything you can to study it. Meet people and talk about it. One of the things that creators make a mistake on is they don't share. They've got an idea, and it's golden. If I tell anybody, they're going to take that idea. Talk to people that you trust. I'm not saying post it on the internet. Don't do that. What I'm saying is talk to people you trust and get feedback. Talk to experts. If you have an opportunity to travel, go there. Live it. There is no substitute for drinking the water, wearing the clothes, doing all the stuff that's from that place, getting, getting dirty. We were building the creative for Far Cry 5. We actually went to Montana. It's a very cool place. I fell in love with it. We drove around. We were there for about 14 days. And I kept saying, I want to get dirty. I want to get dirty, guys. I'm not getting dirty enough. I'm not living this. So they took me to a farm. <laughs> and it was the day that they were seeing if the cows were pregnant. <sighs> and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so if you can't travel, I totally understand. I get it. It can be expensive. It can be difficult. But what I would say is, is that there's people who live in your town or for your, 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 the place where you live a city where there's people there that can help inform you about these ideas. Talk to them. Invest in taking a look around your world, even if you can't get a plane or a boat to go do it. Eat the food. Live it. Wear the clothes. And if you don't know what your idea is, take a look at television. There are some amazing things going on with documentaries about these places that show you what these places are, if it's a place or if it's a thing or if it's a culture that you want to, you want to look into. Go on social media. A lot of these places, a lot of these people have pages, and you can learn about it. But probably the most important thing I would say is look around. Be present and be aware. And I'm going to tell you a story of something that happened to me, which is super innocuous, but it really helps me inform characters. I'm driving one day, and I'm on my way to work, and I'm late. It's about 9.05. I've got about 30 minutes before I get to work. I'm supposed to be in a meeting because there's really important people coming in on a plane. And I'm like, holy shit. And I, I pull up onto the freeway, and it's like just a wall of traffic. It's like somebody invented traffic and just put it in front of me. It's punishing, OK? And I'm like, shit, what am I going to do? So I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting, and I'm dying inside. And then the lane opens up. So I head out. And then this guy shows up, <laughs> a goddamn white car. OK, now I have uh, an irrational dislike of people who have white cars, <laughs> OK? Anybody in here have a white car? Okay, you're suspect. <laughs> okay, so he pulls out in this white car, and like people who drive white cars do, he's doing like 30 kilometers less than he should be in the lane, and he's sitting there. So I instantly dislike this guy. 
So I pull up behind him. I'm laying on the horn. I'm right behind him. I'm just being an absolute dick, right? And he does something really interesting. I'm laying on the horn. I'm making a time. Get out of the way. Move. And he's super chill. And this is what he does. I'm going to turn around because this is what I saw. He reaches up, and he opens up a sunroof all the way back. And then he just does this. <laughs> so I burst out laughing at seeing this. And then he sees me, and he bursts out laughing, and we have a moment. <laughs> and what I realized is that I had built up this idea of this guy who drives this white car and is driving super slow. And I'd made a cliche idea of him in my mind, and he was actually a complex individual, and we had a moment of love and hate inside of like five seconds. And now, no joking aside, every time I make a character, I ask, what's their, I always ask, what makes them special, what makes them unique, what little bit of spice do they put on top of what it is that they do? I still remember that guy. So carrying on with the theme, watch movies, Watch television, and specifically some of the, like, I think about my favorite show, The Sopranos. One of the things that made that show really interesting for me was, there's a very good chance that I'm never going to be a gangster. And I don't think I want to be a gangster, maybe a little. Um, but what was really interesting about that show was that they presented a character, and they presented things in that show that I could relate to. This was a guy who had problems. He had problems at work. He had problems in his marriage. He had problems with his family. He, it was a guy I could relate to. It was very approachable, who also happened to be a gangster. And that mean, meant that somebody who maybe doesn't like gangster films or shows like that has an in to be able to at least understand the complexity of this character. And I thought that was brilliant. Watch the news, read the news, take in the news. I know it's tough right now. I know it's hard. I know sometimes it's scary. But drink it in. Do something that terrifies you or that it makes you scared. Believe it or not, I don't enjoy always doing public speaking. It makes me pretty nervous. But it's something that I do because I want to be able to test myself. I want to be able to try new things. Do something that makes your heart rate jacked every week. Don't do this. It's stupid. <laughs> I talk about theater a little bit because there's something magical that happens in theater. And I think in the digital age, we've lost a little bit of it. Something about being in an audience, watching actors, free form on stage. There's something just magical that I remember from a kid going to the theater. Go to the theater. Invest in that space. There's really cool stuff happening quickly. Talk to the person at work that nobody likes. There's a wall between people. And a lot of times what we do is we choose to not like somebody, and then we don't really further the agenda of understanding why. Talk to the person that seems to have everything figured out. If you don't play a musical instrument, at least enjoy someone who does. Be around it. It can furnish your brain with new ideas. Have a legitimately different emotion as often as you can. You're not going to be able to write and or build or plumb the depths of an emotion if you haven't experienced it and if you don't risk. A lot of the times, we walk around wearing masks, and we want to be cool, and we don't want to show who we really are. Let those masks, masks drop every once in a while and be free to experience those emotions and show that to other people. Play games. There's amazing games out there. Listen to podcasts. For those people out there, those kids out there, anybody who's going to school and they're struggling and they... They maybe don't learn the way that other folks learn. I sucked at school. It was super hard. And what I really wished is that some of the podcasts that are out there right now about history and about science and all the things that are really interesting were there when I was there. Listen to those podcasts. They're super smart. Have a beer. Chill out. Creatives get locked in their own heads a lot of times. And they forget to take a step back. And what you got to be able to do is, within the confines of making sure that you don't hurt anybody, do the things that's necessary to unlock your mind a little. Be embarrassed. Say sorry. What day is today? Tuesday? How many people thus far this week have said, I'm sorry? 50%. OK, the rest of you, you guys are perfect? <laughs> Just make sure that you remember we're not all perfect. Make sure you say sorry. Even if you don't think you did anything wrong, look into it and make sure that you're comfortable saying that. Because there's an amazing exchange that happens between people when you do it. Write your ideas down and then argue the opposite. Learn what it's like to argue the opposite, and then believe in it. Stay in school, which seems like an obvious one. But when you do, make sure that you keep the camera lens wide. Make sure that you look at the things that are going on in the hallway. Take a look at your teachers. Look at everything that can inform you about the reality of life while you're there. 
Get the shit kicked out of you by love. Get your heart broken. It's going to be very difficult to believe that you can make something that's going to talk about these themes without having actually experienced it. Listen to music, and I'm not saying music that you like. I'm saying music that you actually loathe. Listen to new forms of music. Challenge yourself to do it. There's a chance that you'll find something new, and it can send you in a completely different direction. Talk to somebody over the age of 75. Seriously, these people have lived life, and they've been around long enough to see it come full circle. They are oracles. Mind those oracles. And if you can, go camping. One of the things that happens in the digital age is that we have a tendency to step away from each other. We have a tendency to step away from nature. And if you're able to turn everything off and you're able to go camping, you can step back into that and it can send you in a brand new direction. What I'm basically saying is say yes to life. Be a voracious consumer of life, all of it. That is the cheesiest PowerPoint. Oh my God, sorry about that. Okay, the question that I get asked also is, do you use this on Far Cry? Absolutely, for sure I do. When we're first thinking about the idea for Far Cry, specifically Far Cry 5, I wanted to leverage what I already knew and what I felt. So I was born in 1972, and this was kind of what I remember in a nutshell of what was happening in the 70s. And it's kind of color-coded from the standpoint of that this I don't remember very much, and then it kind of gets more into specific relief here. Of course, I remember Star Wars. Everybody remembers Star Wars. But the two things that I really remember that stick with me, that haunt me, were I remember this idea of a gasoline shortage. And it scared the shit out of me as a little kid because it was the first time that I discovered we could run out of stuff. And it was important stuff. And the second one is I remember the story of Jonestown. I don't know if you guys all know that story. But the story of this magnetic leader who basically turned what was supposed to be a good idea into a horrible idea and basically convinced a bunch of people to kill themselves. And I remember hearing about that story and being stricken by it, even as a little kid. But so I was born in 1972. Let's be honest, I was a child of the 80s. This is what I remember. I remember all this stuff. And what I really remember about the 80s was that it was the decade of excess. Everybody was buying stuff. And they were almost acting like there was no tomorrow. And I suspect I know why. Because during the 80s, this is what was going on underneath. What I remember as a kid in the 80s is looking up at the Cold War between the former Soviet Union and America and being terrified at what I saw. What I remember is this Cold War being aggressive and me feeling impotent, looking up at it and going, I feel so small. Somebody's got their finger on the button and everything could just go south at a moment's notice. And it was informing all the stuff that I was watching. The Terminator about the end of times and somebody coming back and trying to fix it. This movie here, War Games all about somebody who was trying to stop a war with like a home computer. I had a home computer. I was worried about war. It spoke to me. This movie here, did anybody see this movie the day after? Terrifying. I remember this when I was a kid. I couldn't sleep for like a week. All about this concept of an apocalypse. And I really felt at that age that it was possible that the end of times was coming. This is what I was afraid of. This is what I was worried about. And if I try and bring that down into one image, one thing that I remember, it's this. That's what I felt. And then something miraculous happened. It feels like we took a step back from the cliff. And it feels like people st cooler heads started to prevail. The Berlin Wall fell. And I think globally, everybody just took a big sigh of relief. <sighs> OK, we're safe. It's not going to be annihilation. And I remember kind of just letting it go, not thinking about it for 10 to 15 years. I even forgot the feeling of that precipice and that danger. And then this happened, 9-11. I think everybody remembers where they were on that day. It was a terrible day. And I remember I didn't recognize that the feeling was back, but I did recognize that something had come back, something I wasn't sure what it was. And then in 2007, 2008, I remember the, uh, I was living in Chicago at the time, and I, was, I remember very clearly the subprime mortgage collapse and hearing people for the first time, at least in my memory, since that earlier time, start to talk about where's the government? Why are they, who's at the helm of this? Why are they not protecting us? This is our legacy. This is our lives. Who's in charge here? An abject frustration. And then I started to notice that the language of the global village started to change. And the language moved away from we and us, and it moved into them. 
And I started to feel that feeling coming back, this feeling of separation. I didn't know what it meant. Then I also started to hear rumors of groups who were disenfranchised, possibly military. And I was walking downtown Toronto about three, three and a half years ago. And this guy walks uh, around a corner, and he's kind of disheveled, and he's wearing a sandwich board. And on the sandwich board is something like this. The end is near, and I had two thoughts. Number one is, holy shit, that guy might be right. Number two is, I've never had that thought before. And I realized this was back. So I took all of that, the themes and ideas that I had experienced in the 70s that kind of haunted me, some of the themes and ideas that I experienced in the 80s that haunted me, and the things that I was feeling three years ago, and I built a collage. It was way more complex than this. It was huge, but it looked something like this. And then what I did is I took all of that and I put it into one person, the main villain in, our, in Far Cry 5. I put it into his brain and we created a character who believes that the end of times is coming and that we have to prepare because it's inevitable. Humanity doesn't have the maturity to be able to step back from the ledge. And that is the theme that informed Far Cry 5. So, okay, I'm a big guy, I get a deep voice when I say that, everybody starts, like babies start to cry and stuff. Everybody chill out, <laughs> okay? What we're actually here to talk about is not Far Cry 5, we're here to talk about the whole concept of how you can use this and how you can use it in your creative. We're talking about process, okay? So how do we process this? Well, you're gonna need a team, and to be honest, the team comes much earlier, and you're gonna need a lot of smart people to be able to leverage this and, and be able to contribute it as well. There's big teams out there, and what we're talking about is big teams, incredible talent, lots of egos, big stakes, and it's tough to manage. Maybe they live all over the world. Maybe they have different cultures. Maybe they speak different languages. Maybe they're not even in the same time zone. And in truth, what we're talking about here is there's also different cultures from the standpoint of where you might work. A place might be very, very good at technology. Another place might be really good at creative. Another place might be good at business or be fixated on process. And the point I would make is, how do you manage that many creative people, that many unique creative people? Well, there's two lessons that I've learned. Number one, this seat is sacred. Who equals what? You've got to surround yourself with passionate people who want to make a difference, who, want to be, who are artistic or creative, who want to basically row in the direction of a great creative vision and contribute to it and are positive. That's imperative. That seat is sacred. Who equals what? And number two, one size does not fit all when it comes to management style. Not at all. And when I think of talking to managers about how you leverage this creative talent, what I'm talking about is folks who look at it and say, how do we make it so that these folks all work? When I think about where I was before UB or coming to a situation where I'm looking at the culture of an existing studio or the culture of an existing team, the first thing you gotta do is take a step back and see what people naturally do and do well. So I tried to figure out how I could explain this the idea of getting a fresh perspective and leveraging the people you have. And I came up with this toy. You guys remember this? Your kids? It's an amazing toy because what it did is it kind of gave you a fresh perspective. It had these discs and you would just pop it in, you pull the handle and, and you get a brand new image and a brand new perspective on things. So I tried to look at it from my perspective, which is games. And I tried to figure out, is there a way that I can explain how you might better leverage creative talent in an industry that I know nothing about? So, I picked music, and here's my analogy. Imagine that your team is a band, and imagine that you've got a lead singer, you've got somebody who plays the guitar, you've got a percussionist, you've got somebody who's got it on the bass, you've got somebody who plays the piano, and you've got somebody who does horns. Now that's interesting. These are each creative people. They're unique creative people, and you wanna be able to leverage all that talent and make great music. But the challenge is, they all have different personalities. They may even be governed by different things. You may have an activist, you may have somebody who loves to travel, somebody who's got a problem, somebody who secretly believes that they should be the lead singer. You've got people who maybe just got the shit kicked out of them by love, and you've got somebody who's super chill. Compound interest on that is, they may not like each other, and there's a very good chance that they all wanna make their own solo album. <laughs> this is challenging, but that's okay. What it takes is not one size fit all, and what I would ask you is, would you apply one recipe to managing all these creative people? 
I don't think you would. I think you'd take a step back and you'd look at them and go, how can I furnish their agenda? How can I help them be the best they can be? That requires leadership, but it also requires diplomacy. And the idea that you can manage all of those talents and all of those different feelings and emotions and rally them around a single vision with one band with everybody making one album. If you want to inspire, if you want to surprise, if you want to evoke and amaze and innovate, you have to be prepared to hire unique people who think differently, who challenge you, who provoke you, who are relentless, and make you better. This is the band that I get to work with. Now, iteration. Once you have a vision, how much does it change over time? I get asked that all the time. And the reality is it changes quite a bit. It can change quite a bit. People have a tendency to write it down, and once they write it down, it becomes canon. And they believe that it's gold and they can't change it. I would argue that that page can be folded into a cube and you can kind of look through it. And I would even say that it's not paper, it's probably glass. And what you should do is hold it up and look at it and get a sense how those ideas look as you look through them. Again, I come back to this, an important exercise. Go ahead, load in a new perspective, pull the handle, and change a location. Change a theme. Change the time. Change the player action, the verbs of what the player is doing the situation, or even a character itself. Test it. Now, here's the problem. Iteration's expensive. Not everybody likes it. I had a review a few years back, and somebody said to me, I would very much appreciate it if you would not iterate. <laughs> and I would very much appreciate that you get it right the first time. And I remember thinking, I would very much appreciate it if you would fuck off forever. <laughs> you have to iterate, OK? Whether you call it tuning, or tightening, or editing, or adjusting, or trimming, or scoping, make it tactical. And those folks that come by and tell you don't, don't iterate, make sure you don't offend them and say, yes, I totally understand. And while you're walking away, think, buck off. <laughs> OK, then we talk about feedback. And feedback's super important with your creative. It can be difficult to get feedback. It's not something that we're naturally built to always take. I'm talking about peer review. So there's this thing that we do at UB where you walk into this room, and you've got your ideas, and you present, show and tell. And the first time that it happened, I got super mad, super red. And when I get mad, I get really red, like I'm talking that red. And so I go into this room, and I feel this way, and I'm like, why? And it's because my answer is, it feels like this, <laughs> OK? It feels like there's all the risk, there's no stakes, and that's how I feel. The point of the matter is, is that I shouldn't. This is an opportunity to get pure feedback. This is an opportunity for all of those people to be able to provide their own view masters, to be able to inform your ideas and give you feedback and maybe make your ideas better. But there's an important step that was missing that I'd never experienced until I'd come to UB. And that was that the room changed. Once I had finished talking about the vision, I sat down and the person who was giving feedback stood up and they gave theirs for what they were working on. And that went all the way around the room. And it completely changed my perspective of it. Because the idea of no stakes was gone, and it turned into a new opportunity to get ideas and iterate. And I fell in love with that meeting. So I would strongly encourage that. Then we get to the pitch. And this is the tricky part. This is the part that nobody tells you about. This is where people get stuck. And there's a reason why they get stuck. Sometimes they make their stuff too complicated. They don't lock it down. They don't, they, it's just too heady, and people can't wrap their, 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 their ideas around it. They just don't get it. It should be simple. It should be short. It should be easy. It should be something that you can do in an elevator. Keep it simple. This was the pitch for Far Cry 5. Dan, what's the middle of the game about? The main character, the main villain, the protagonist, the antagonist, all this, how do they feel? The part after the second part and that subpart, that's the game we're making. Take your swatch, boil it down to its essence. Keep the pitch simple. Then there's something that people don't talk about that much, which is the room. And everybody knows the idea of home court advantage. When you're making that pitch, you definitely don't always have home court. It's tough. That room can be austere. That room can feel really tough. And to make it worse, some of the people that are in that room 
may not appreciate exactly what you do. They may not have the same language. They may be from PR, they may be from marketing, they may be from business. They may not have the same feelings that you have or the parlance in how you communicate. And you end up feeling like this again. And my point is, is that there's a very simple thing that you can do that kind of awakens everybody. Leverage your audience. How many of you guys have been camping? Okay, some of the best stories I ever heard in the entirety of my life were around a campfire. Ghost stories, everybody knows that moment, the smell of the campfire, somebody breaks out a really good ghost story and you are riveted, it's fantastic. Build a campfire. When we think about a campfire, we have been sitting around these things for millennia. Before we had texting, before we had TV, before we even wrote down our ideas, we communicated them over this. We shared it. Build a campfire and keep it simple. But be wary of the sound. <laughs> so, you've done all this work. You've data mined yourself. You've drunk everything from the real world. You've changed, changed your ideas into a vision. You've built a team, you've iterated, there's feedback, you have your pitch and then you get the sound. I'm gonna give you an example of the sound. Mom and Dad, I wanna quit school and I wanna make games for a living. <laughs> That's the sound, okay? Now, the thing about the sound is that it is truly creative kryptonite and you're gonna run into it, right? It's also sometimes coupled with the face, which is, <laughs> people aren't just gonna get it. I just don't get it, those are tough words. What I would tell you is, there's gonna be times where you're gonna fail, and that's okay. What I would say at that moment is, have thick skin, then have a beverage, <laughs> and think of it as peer review and an opportunity to iterate. Because eventually, you are going to get a green light, and it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> and when you do, lock that shit down. Lock it down. There's moments to iterate, super important that you do, but at the point where you have that green light, lock it down, you can continue to tweak and edit and adjust, but don't offer wholesale changes to your vision. Create your swatch, put it on the wall, and every time somebody asks you a question about it, point at it. Probably most importantly, and I put it mid to the end, is don't forget about the player. Our industry is changing very, very quickly. And each of these are an opportunity to talk to the player. The danger that some creatives have is that they get locked in their own head and their ideas are gold and they can't possibly share them because somebody will steal them. That's not true. What's amazing about the time we live in is that in, like, unlike any other time, you have the ability to go on Twitch, you have the ability to go online and take a look at somebody playing your game real time. The feedback is instantaneous. You see the emotion, you see the enjoyment, you see the hate and you can use all that, you can leverage all that. Same with sharing your idea. Make sure you talk to people about it. Don't keep it to yourself. Again, don't post it on the internet, but talk to your friends. Talk to somebody that you trust. Talk to another player of games. Talk to your team. They all play games. They wanna give you feedback. They wanna weigh in on the process. And all the way through iteration and feedback and pitch and even the sound, understand this, the band. In years past, what we've thought of is that we as developers are in the band and players are the audience. It's not true anymore. Players are in the band. Make sure they're part of the music. It's super important that you do that. And now we get to the money. And this is the part that I don't think is gonna be exactly what you think it's gonna be. This is a business. Understand that. It's probably not your money fueling the game. It's probably not your company. It may not be your employees. Don't focus so much on the money and just try and be inspirational. Focus on that. And this is something that is super hard to do. This is something that I struggle with all the time. When you're working on something creative, it's your baby. It's very difficult to be positive all the time. It's very difficult to be a cheerleader or to get people going. It's very, very hard. So surround yourself with people that will remind you that is part of your job and be inspirational. The summary of that is this. Use your brain and use what you know. Leverage what you already know. Consume what you can from the world. Build your swatch. Distill it down into the barest essence of a vision. Get feedback and iterate when you do, when you get that green light. Lock that shit down. 
and be inspirational. And don't forget about the money or they'll fucking fire you. <laughs> so we'll get to part three. And this is where I put my money where my mouth is, hopefully. Here's what happens. I want to actually pitch an experience to you guys live. And I've been kind of warned that this could be amazing. This could also be a fiasco. I say, fuck it, let's give it a try. You guys in? Is that OK? Yeah. All right, so here's the deal. Step one, leverage what I already know. And what I told you is that I was born in 1972, and this is what, this is what I was living. This is what I saw. But what I didn't tell you was there was something that was incredibly important in my life at that time. And it was the most important thing in my life. And I still remember it today, and it still has a place in my heart. And it's this. You guys did not see that coming, right? <laughs> but the teddy bear that I had didn't look like that. It looked like this. It's kind of rough looking. It was blue and white. Really? <laughs> wow. And here's the thing about that teddy bear is that it really was there as I was learning who I was. It's an amazing thing when you had a toddler, a teddy bear. You know, the first thing they try and do is eat it. The second thing they do is they have a conversation with it, and it's a legitimate conversation. It's super cool to see them talk to this thing and learn and discover and communicate. That's what I did. Of course, you learn about love and all that stuff from your family, but it's the first time that you learn it from this, this thing. True friendship. This bear was my buddy my best friend. And if anybody tried to touch that fucking bear, <laughs> there was trouble. What it was, was imagination fuel. It was fantastic. Looking at that bear and basically formulating my perceptions about the world just based off of my friendship with this bear. But like all things, you kind of grow up. The bear gets put up on the shelf. And over time, you forget. You go to school. And trust me, you can't take that bear to school. You're going to get your ass kicked. <laughs> you see the real world. You drink in the real world. And you get new ideas. Imagination Fuel 2.0. And I remember later on in life, I remember hearing a really cool story. And it stuck with me. Just like the bear was important, this story left an indelible mark on me. And that was the story of Prometheus. For those of you who don't know the story, there's a lot of different versions of the story. But the story that I remember um, was the idea that there was a war between the titans and the gods. And Prometheus was a titan, and Zeus was a god, and the gods won. And at the end of that war, Prometheus kind of switched sides. And Zeus said, I want you to build mankind. So what he did is he got some clay, and he began to build mankind. And as he put mankind down into the mud, he said to Zeus, give them something. Give them fire. Let them grow. Let them, like, give them something. And Zeus said, no. So Prometheus went. And he stole fire from Zeus, and he gave it to mankind. And it became the birth of culture and metalwork, and became this whole idea of the, the birth of thought. And Prometheus was punished for this. I believe he was basically chained to a rock, and he had an eagle eat his liver every day. And it would, his liver would regrow, and he'd have to eat it every day, which sounds horrible. Um, but the story was really interesting to me. And I just thought the idea of that gift of thought, and it stuck with me. But then, like the bear, kind of went off into the ether. I went to a new school. I started to think more about a larger world and even some of the stuff about exploration and leaving the world. And I got a whole bunch of new ideas. And that exploration and that moment of leaving the world got me into space and the interest in space travel and just the imagination of it. And I remember thinking about going out among the stars and even going to another planet. But after a while, life gets in the way. And you put that on the shelf. And then I got a call from BAFTA. And it was like, what if I could leverage those in an idea? So I went back to the shelf. I dusted them off. And here's my pitch. I want to retell the story of Prometheus giving that key moment of thought. But I want to replace fire with a teddy bear. And I want to put it in space because it's fucking awesome. That's my pitch. <laughs> Now, underneath the laughter, here's what I heard. <laughs> because it's not really a pitch. It's just a whole bunch of ideas thrown together. And I just don't get it, right? So here's what I did. Luckily, I work at Ubisoft. It's a super cool place. There's a lot of smart people there. So I went, and I started to think about whether or not I could build a team around this. Some people thought I was nuts. Other people were, were embracing it. And this is Serge Marino. And for those of you who don't know him, 
He was the art director on Child of Light, a very cool game. So I went to Serge and I said, Serge, here's what I want to do. And I told him, and he didn't make the sound. Because what I did is I made sure that I told it to him in story form and I made sure that I made a campfire. So Serge and I met for 17 minutes. And since then, we've only met twice more for a total of three hours. And this is what we came up with. I told him the story and he basically illustrated it. And we iterated on it. We pitched an experience. And here's the pitch. It starts with a bear and a little girl who loves her bear in space, because it's cool. <laughs> she lives out in space. She's a normal parent. She's a normal life. She loves this bear. She has tea parties with the bear. She has birthdays with the bear. She has little parties with the bear. She goes to bed every night knowing that this bear is there to protect her. It's her buddy. Until one night, she's not protected. One night, danger strikes. A klaxon goes off. The parents come running into the room. Oh my God, we've got to take you. They pick her up and they rush outside and the bear is left in the bed and she turns and she screams, no, get my bear. She runs back, she grabs the bear and they head for the spaceship. But at the last possible minute, she stumbles and she drops the bear. The doors close and she sits there pressed up against it going, screaming no as the bear is left behind. And the rocket takes off and goes into space and gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the bear sits alone on the edge of a great precipice until a gust of wind pushes it down. And down into the hole it goes, further and further, past caves and monsters and all manners of creatures and all kinds of things until it finds its way all the way down to the center of the planet. And it rests in inky darkness alone until it sees a little light suspended from a little string. That light gets bigger until it presents itself as a little creature staring at this teddy bear. And this creature has a name. It's called a Razagaboo. <laughs> now the Razagaboos are very inquisitive creatures sitting there looking at it, but they've never left the cave. They never have any information about the world outside. They don't know what this thing is. So this Razagaboo looks at it and offers a soft little purr to the other Razagaboos that are up in their webs, and they all come down. And they move forward gingerly, carefully, looking at this bear. No clue what it is. Forward and forward until they touch it. And here's what's really interesting. That's when they have their Prometheus moment. In this case, it's a Razga moment. <laughs> this is where, up until that moment, they've only ever thought of building their webs in 2D. But they saw that this thing was built out of yarn, and they understood that it could be built in 3D. They could re-engineer what they build. And they had that lightning strike of, we can build in three dimensions. This changed everything about the Razga Boos their understanding of their education, the idea of their culture, and the idea of their engineering. So this is our call to action. This is what we want players to play. We want them to play as a Razagaboo. We want them to journey out of the darkness back to the light. We want them to go off where no Razagaboo has gone before, but it's not going to be easy. There's going to be unknown dangers and creatures. There's going to be challenges and puzzles. They'll have to engineer their way around. Maybe they can bridge, maybe they can push. There'll be collapses, there'll be cave-ins, there'll be obstacles, there will be monsters. But eventually, they will reach the surface and return that teddy bear to a very happy little girl in space. That's my pitch. And we call this... <laughs> no. So, I'm glad you guys liked it, but what's really important about this is I want feedback. I want to iterate. I want to be able to test the process. I want to make this better. It doesn't do any good to just have the idea. We've got to be able to take it out there and see if we can make it better. So I come back to, and I believe I've got a few minutes left, and then we'll do Q&A. I want to involve you guys in this process. So I want to come back to that Viewmaster, and I want to look at it and maybe drop in something and change it. So we could change the Prometheus idea. We could change the teddy bear, we could change the girl, we could change the Razagaboo. 
You guys like that name? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to change that. Okay. <laughs> we change space, we could change the construct. But for the purposes of this, I just want to focus on the bear. And I want to ask the question of what if. How many of you guys had stuffed animals when you were a kid? There you go. Okay. Uh, what did you guys have? What did you have? You had a bear. Somebody yell out something that wasn't a bear. Okay, sorry, let me do that again. <laughs> you, what did you have? Really? It's kind of cool. What did you have? I had a sheep. That's cool. Okay. Did, did anybody have a panda bear? Wow, really? Okay, so here, let's just do something simple, all right? Let's just take the idea of a panda bear, and let's imagine that it wasn't this type of teddy bear that fell down the hole. Let's imagine that it was a panda bear, and let's affect the story, and let's change the ripples. Let's, let's chase those ripples and see what happens. So the panda bear goes down, and it's black and white. <coughs> and the chief Razagaboo comes out and looks at it and says, what is this? It's monochromatic. It's black and white. And what he says is, I hereby outlaw color. So the game completely changes. And all these Razagaboos who have the ability to emanate all these colors now live in this totalitarian regime where they can't express themselves. How would that inform the gameplay? What's the first thing you would do if somebody says you can't express yourself? Anybody? Exactly. So the game becomes about going out in the world and painting and tagging the entire Razagaboo landscape with color. And it changes from being something that is a puzzle-based to something that is expressive. That's pretty much all I've got. <laughs> My point is, is that you guys have the ability to contribute to these ideas, and you have the ability to use that swatch. You have the ability to go back and look at each one of these things and iterate. And to the folks who tell you that you shouldn't, don't listen to them. So my five minutes is up. You guys have contributed. I'm glad you like Razagaboo. I'm interested in what you guys have to say. I'll be fielding questions. The point I would make in summary is this. Use what you already know and keep it simple. Consume the world as much as you can. Distill your vision. Make sure you get feedback and you iterate. You don't forget about the player. Lock it down. Be inspirational. Don't forget about the cash. And if you forget all of that and none of that matters, just ask yourself, what's your teddy bear? Thank you. Dan, thank you so much. That was amazing. Cool. Excellent insight into some of how creativity happens, especially at a big studio. And before we field out questions, I have a question for you. Why do you hate white cars so much? You know what? I've just had some bad experiences, and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. I'm, I, I'll be interested to see if anybody asks me a question about what color is the bad guy's car in Far Cry 5. <laughs> Revenge. So you worked, in, um, you worked in film and TV before you worked in games. Yes. What was your path to creative directorship? Oh, man. I wouldn't call it a path. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, you know, I tried a lot of jobs. I tried a lot of different things. And I think that uh, as a creative, as somebody who wants to be creative, I think that uh, I wasn't always courageous in pursuing it. I think that sometimes what would happen is, is that I would do the job that I think other people expected me to do. Um, and so I kind, of, I kind of backed into the job. And it took me a long time to get there. So I think the path for me was I, did a, I was an animator, I was a lighter, I worked in television and film, um, I was an art director, I was a cinema director, um, and then I switched over to production, and then after that I became an executive producer, and then I went sort of back to being a creative director, and I'm both. Great, that's, so, yeah, that's, like that's, yeah, that's, that's quite a zigzaggy path. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to open out two questions from the floor now. If you have a question, raise your hand and the roving mic will find you. Just one little bit. Hello, uh, my name is Neil. I'm a performance capture artist and a voice artist. Um, I've been working a lot in games. I come from a film, television, and stage background, but I'm interested in the collaboration that happens now, which didn't used to happen in motion capture, but is happening more in performance capture, about how sometimes through organic, happy accidents, moments that happen in the volume, even with the, the script, which is usually locked down at that stage, how sometimes collaboration between different types of creatives can actually affect a game. 
and I've been working about eight years now, so I, and I've, I felt the effects of suddenly us having an idea from a different creative point of view. But I was wondering how much of your methodology, whether that's something that you you actively try and seek from performers, or whether that actually is, it, or was it one of those things that because of the mechanics of the game, and et cetera, et cetera, that sometimes it's impossible to do that? I'm no, not it's sure not impossible at all, and you should totally do that. Uh, I think that earlier on in my career, I was, you know, you, you write an earnest story, and you think that every word that's on the page is gold, and anybody that doesn't understand that is stupid, and it's not true at all, right? I think that what's amazing is, is that when you look at uh, Far Cry 3, and you look at Voss, you know, Michael Mando did a lot of that stuff. Like, and you have to be able to let him run. You have to be able to let great artists do what they do. And so I think, you know, we had this idea of what that character was, and, and he was a huge part of making that character great and better. And, and the real question you ask yourself when you're looking at an actor and you're looking at a performance is, do I believe it? And I believe that performance. Same thing with Troy Baker, who was Pagan Min. I mean, he just blew us away. And then, you know, when we were really looking at Far Cry 5, and we were looking at trying to create a character as, as magnetic as the father. Uh, it was tough. It's really, really tough. And you have to have the right performance. You have to have the right actor. So we wrote some stuff, and we thought it was pretty cool. And then you know we, we went wide on Far Cry 5. We got a whole bunch of characters that I would love to tell you about. I'm not allowed to. Um, but it was really cool because this, you know, somebody was working on this, and they call me over, and they're like, Dan, you've got to see this. So I go over, and here's... Greg Brick's performance of our father, and it was incredible. It spent, it just, I basically had chills down my back. And the key thing for me was is that he didn't say exactly what we wanted him to say. He was believable. He made it his own. And for the first time, I'd met somebody, because I think the problem with the concept of cults sometimes is that you know, we're all smart, and I think it's very difficult for us to believe that somebody can get inside our head, and that we're going to follow them, and that we're going to do what they say. And within five minutes of, of seeing that performance, I really did believe that Greg could start his own cult <laughs> and that I might want to be a part of it. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> it's chilling. And, and, and there's, it's super cool to see him work. Um, you know, you try, and, it's, you try and, and play a little bit of one-upsmanship and go, OK, this is really, really cool. And then every time you do, these actors just make it better. And if you don't lean into it, it's swoosh. They, you know, let them run. Let them, let them make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. Let them find those little kernels of genius. So I totally agree with you. There are, it's, it's not a science, right? It's alchemy. And you go into that volume, and you kind of intend to bring pieces in with you, but they don't get assembled in the way you expect. And it's magic. The one down here at the front. Hi. So um, I think it's been obvious over the last year that AAA single-player games have been struggling to, to pay the bills in the end. Um, I think we've seen a lot of games that have been great but have actually struggled when they've gone out into the market. And as a result of that, I think there's been a lot more emphasis on monetization approaches that have actually started to change the nature of the game itself. So my question is, how do you remain inspirational and retain your creative vision when the pressure to make money is actually pressuring your own vision in the first place? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, is not easy, right? I mean, uh, it's a business, and I think that there's always going to be pressures to find new ways to, to incentivize and do those different types of things. But the truth is, is that I really do try and focus on, and I think we all try and focus on bringing a product that people can play, and that when they play it, the way they invest it is based off of how they want to. I don't want to give you a bullshit producer answer too much, but, but it's a tough question right now, and I think people are struggling with it. Um, with our game, we're still you know, thinking about how to manage certain things. But what I know is, is that our emphasis right now is on building an open world and building a system that you can go and play it the way that you want to play it. And it, that really informs everything we do. It would have been super simple for us to make a linear game, really simple. We didn't do it. We made a game where the player can go out and invest and play and meet and bring people along with them in the order that they want to play it. And that's difficult but it's something that we think is important. Is it different at different studios to the extent to which creatives are exposed to the imperative to monetize? I think so. I think it's, it's always out there. Yeah, right? It probably so. must be a part of everybody's life. That they yeah, you're always going to, it is a business, and you're always going to have conversations about it. But I think what I really like about Yubi is that a lot of the times the conversations that we end up having is about what the player wants, right? And then we ask. And I think that, um, 
it's a very, it's, it's a different mindset. Um, I, whenever, whenever you want to know what somebody does, don't ask them to tell them what they do. Ask them how they spend their day, because it's very difficult to spin that, right? And a lot of my day is talking about the creative. A lot of my day is dealing with people that are super smart and creative and ideas and narrative and game systems, and that's what we spend our time. Not done for you? So in the beginning, you spoke a lot about leveraging uh, human knowledge and human experience, things like that. But in this day and age where game developers are so prolific, where do you think the line is drawn when that human knowledge is kind of assumed game language? Because we don't want to just restrict the market to people that play games already. We want to open it up and be inspirational. How do you combat that differentiation between the assumed knowledge of gamers? It's funny. I wasn't really talking about the assumed knowledge of gamers. Uh, in systems, what I was talking about is just the the, the DNA of everybody, um, and I think that uh, I think that the spectrum is much is, is broader. I think that when we're talking about leveraging what you already know, what I'm trying to say to folks is, as creatives, sometimes we overcomplicate things and we assume what players want or what people who read our stories want, and it, it might be better to just ask and to hear their thoughts. When I ask the question about what kind of teddy bear did you have, or did anybody have a teddy bear, I was shocked at how many hands went up. And I think that that's an important thing where when you're thinking about what you're creating, you want to be able to touch folks in a way that it leverages what they already know. And that's, that's sort of what the presentation was about. Did anyone not have a teddy bear? I'm curious. Really? No one in this room did not have a teddy bear. Are you OK? <laughs> huh? Stick around, dude. We can get you one like in two hours. <laughs> How does the size of a studio impact the um, focus that you're able to have in the vision? Does, does, when you have a team of two, three hundred people, does that make it more difficult to stick to a vision than it would if you had a team of ten? Oh, I think so. I think that's, I, I, I can lie to you and tell you, no, 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 it's super easy and everybody rolls in the same direction and it's, it's like a Swiss watch and it's great. It doesn't work like that. I think that the bigger the studio gets, the more that you get fractals of ideas going off and you, you're building stuff and maybe going in different directions. I think it's very much like a large tanker. If you try and turn it, you can't turn it quick. It's not nimble. But what's amazing about that is it's got great inertia. And when you deliver it, you're, you're delivering something that's generous and amazing for people to play. Any questions right here? Hi. Um, do you have any advice for uh, when you should kill an idea? Whoa, that's a good question. Do I have any advice for when you should kill an idea? I think you'll know, right? A lot of times we don't listen to ourselves. Uh, I think you'll know. I think we, we do all kind of know. If, if there's a, what's that phrase? If there's a doubt, there's no doubt. Um, I think that uh, the other side of that is I think a lot of people struggle with the confidence to put their ideas forward. So I think there's some very confident people that drive to an idea and they can't let it go. And I don't think I'm too worried about that. I think the world has a way of letting people know that their ideas are not good. Um, I don't think that's the problem we have. I think the problem we have is that there's a lot of good ideas that don't get made. And there's a lot of good ideas that don't get heard. And there's a lot of things that we can leverage that we're not. But in terms of uh, how you know when to kill something, um, I think it's just that sound. I really. I hate that fucking sound. I hate it, like with the heat of a Nova. But you get it, and, and, and you hear somebody, you, you know, you give that idea, and what you want to hear is, oh, it's super cool. And, and it's just, oh, it's brutal. So yeah, the sound, that's my answer. Another question up here? I, um, so you were talking quite a lot about the way that you can take... Um, <coughs> sorry, I've got a cold. I'm not normally this deep. Um, there's a, about the way you can take inspiration from like quite broad themes, really, So uh, and you kind of narrow that down into a vision that maybe guides more of the, the projects. And I, I was wondering how, when you discuss vision, how much of that is thematic, how much is a specific narrative that you've kind of really honed in on, how much of it is... Uh, mechanical, I guess more in, in the sense of maybe a new IP as opposed to like mm -hmm. Far Cry where those might be already kind of set. But how, how do you balance those in that initial kind of stage when you're trying to sort of sell the idea of, of a project? That's a really good question about the idea of 
How do you leverage what you already have? If you're working on an existing IP, you, what you don't want to do is just throw out everything and just start from scratch. Um, you want to be able to leverage, you know, be mature and leverage what you have. But at the same time, you want to be able to make sure that the idea can grow. And it's a constant question between revolution and evolution, knowing what the right balance is. And I think you got to trust your people, right? You got really smart people who will remind you, hey, listen, you're throwing out these great systems. We did all this work. Uh, and this is really cool. And here's where it can grow. So I think at that point, it's about listening to your team and trusting them to help you furnish the vision. Uh, it won't be exactly, you know, if you're going to be a creative director, you're going to put out a vision and it's not going to be exactly what you thought. And I think sometimes if you're not mature enough to be able to look at that and realize that that's okay, it's a lot like, you know, having a situation with an actor. And if, you, if you're not thinking about it and saying, let's, let, let's see where this goes, uh, you can get crushed. I think the harder thing is that sometimes when you're finishing a game, it's, it's devastating to leave something that you really want in the game on the cutting room floor. That's super, super hard. And I, you know, it's happened on Far Cry 3, it's happened on Far Cry 4, I know it'll happen on Far Cry 5, but I'm still not emotionally prepared for that. It's just really, really tough to cut something that you think has value and can grow over the brand over time. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question about what you leverage, and I think the answer is trust your team, they'll let you know. Got another question down the front here? Hey, um, so I'm a games journalist and I get pitched games quite a lot and often how developers try to pitch it is they'll say, well, it's kind of like Candy Crush, but you crush cars, oh. car crusher. And um, it's strange because I think part of that comes from people drawing inspiration from within the game, games industry and not reaching beyond it. And part of it comes from a fear of people not understanding what they're pitching, so they try and root it in what they know um, and basically my question is, how would you pitch an idea that's so off the wall that kind of reconstructs what we know about games, what we expect from games, in a way that people will understand without kind of pulling back in on what we know? That's a big question. Um, it's a good question. How do you pitch? I, I don't know if there's one formula for it. I think that, uh, you know, when I was first pitching the construct of what was a lot of themes in Far Cry 5, not everybody got it. The world is a different place three and a half years ago. And so, you know, you throw out the idea of uh, the end of times, you throw out the idea of a cult, you throw out the idea of this magnetic leader, and everybody's like, no, that's, that doesn't seem believable. And then time goes on, and all of a sudden start, things start happening, and people start to maybe lean towards, well, maybe that's a little bit more believable, but it's just difficult. You gotta have thick skin. You gotta stick with it if you, if you believe in it. And it's a little bit to the question of how do you know when to kill it? It's hard. It's really hard to, um, and that's why I put Kermit the Frog up there, because it definitely sometimes feels like that. It feels a little bit lonely for you to stand up in front of a pitch and have everybody look at it, and everybody, and you have to be tough, you have to have thick skin. And I think that if you believe in it, and you leverage the team, and you leverage the systems that you've got, um, I think that the pitch can survive and kind of be forged in the fire. Um, but there's no question it's extremely tough. It's an extremely tough process, and, and not everybody can survive it. It's really tough. It's really, if I haven't told you this, it's super tough. <laughs> something that question hinted at, I think, is something that a lot of people who play, who play games for a long time think quite often, which is that gaming's frame of reference can be very narrow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you find that games reference other games a lot. And they reference things like Star Wars, one or two kind of big <laughs> common points of pop culture. Do you feel that gaming's frame of reference can be too narrow? And what can be done to widen it? Sure, I, I think that it's, it's, you know, you're in pitches and, and somebody goes, like you were saying, like it's like this. And you're like, okay, I get it, but w what's new? What's different? And it's really hard to do. Um, I think that uh, it's funny the conversation is about is, is, the, is the view of the gamer narrow? And I, I don't think it is. I think there are times where it can seem that way. But I think what's really interesting right now is that um, when I think about things like Stranger Things, or I think about things that are not games, think about the fact that look at the nostalgia for the 80s that's there right now. Look at these ideas that are coming out. Look at this, this brand that's being built. And that's all stuff that we lived. We all drank the same water at the same time. We all had the same experiences. We all have the same memories. And this thing comes on television and everybody goes, oh my God, this is amazing. This is my childhood. And we all love it, or at least I love it. Um, but I think that sometimes 
in the conversation with gamers, yes, it can, it can get a little bit about a system or that we don't widen it as much as it could be. And I think that as we mature and as we grow, that conversation just gets bigger. I think one of the things you mentioned was listen to music, read books, yeah. watch TV, yeah. do things that aren't video games. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and you'll, you'll hear it. I play a lot of games, but I also do a lot of other stuff. We all do. And I think that you've got to be prepared to, to look and, and take and drink in and experience as much as you can in as many different directions. Because I swear to God, I, I still use this all the time. <laughs> And I, it's a little thing, it's, it's super cool. You know, you're building a character, and I'm like, oh, I don't believe this character. It's not, it's not surprising to me. What's the little thing? What's the little bit of spice? And you can find it anywhere. You can find it in real world, you can find it in stories, you can read a great book, you can go to play, and you can find these moments of genius, these kernels of genius, where you'd least expect it. Question in the middle there. Hello. So I really like the uh, process that you put up, and I really like how you reach the end and all of the steps. But I wanted to ask, um, because, you know, Far Cry number five is sort of obvious you're going to build some sort of Far Cry iteration. Um, when you had all of these 70s, 80s things put together, and that's a great idea, did you, were you looking for a Far Cry villain-shaped hole to fill? Or did you have these and said, well, actually, this fits into this big, big game that I'm building anyways? Wow. Um, I'm not sure I entirely get it. Are you, are you thinking that when I, when I was pitching yarn? No, no, no. So, oh, okay. um, so you said 70s, 80s, yeah. uh, end of the world, yep. uh, prophecy, this yes. guy who has a cult. So when you had that, were uh -huh. you looking for something that fills a Far Cry villain? Or did you have this idea, and then you said, well, it could be a Far Cry game villain? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, no, I think that, well, I think that as a matter of process, uh, what, it's the chicken or the egg, which one came first. I think as a matter of process, it's, uh, I, I don't honestly remember. I think what happened was is that I, I think what it was is that I know that Far Cry, we've done a pretty good job of building these villains. And I kept thinking, how do we make this villain have purpose? So it probably starts there, right? How do we make it have purpose? And then I had this feeling like something was wrong with the world, something was off. And I said, how do I take those two things and kind of bring them together, right? Let's chocolate and peanut butter and smash them together and see what happens. And it was really interesting to see that this villain had purpose, this villain had a belief. And as soon as I started to be able to take the personality matrix of a boss or a pagan min and begin to apply the belief that the end of the world was coming, that character got very, very interesting. And then make them magnetic and then have a family that's with them and have all these different characters and that he's a manipulator, but he does it for a reason that he thinks is valid. He truly believes that he's saving you. He truly believes that at the end of this, when the apocalypse is over, you're gonna to turn to him two, three weeks later and say, thank you. And that's chilling. A question at the back here. Hey there, thanks for the talk, man. Um, I really like Far Cry, but I actually think Yarn was really cool. Okay. And, um, I, you know, looking at things like, you know, classic books you buy for your, your kid, like the, the Caterpillar book and stuff like that, Far Cry's got that mass appeal um, and probably will sell far more units than something like Yarn would. But I kind of feel like the games industry has a, a, a place for, for Yarn to try to become these, these mass sellers. And I wonder what your thoughts are on how Yarn could kind of get that mass appeal and s potentially sell more than something like Far Cry. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly, this thing's like, it's, we're talking about like two weeks worth of work. We're talking about, we, we just kind of were just riffing off of an idea. And I think that uh, I'm glad you like it. This is literally the first time I've told anybody. Like, um, we kind of just were doing this off to the side. And so I think that I'm gonna go back and think about that. I think if people like what they're hearing, I'll have a new problem, <laughs> right? Like, I'm gonna walk back into the office and some people are gonna be like, what the hell is yarn? And why didn't you tell us? <laughs> I think that's gonna be a serious it's problem. Coming winter so. 2018. Yeah, no. so, yeah. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think, I, oh God, I just made a new problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you like it. Uh, it's certainly something that I'm obviously going to now be forced to think about. Um, 
But I think that, uh, you know, there's a natural thing. If I give you the human answer, which is, you know, is the next game that I'm going to work on yarn, it doesn't have to be me. I think that what I was trying to prove is that, um, you know, good ideas and, and collaborations and opportunities can come and that somebody can take that idea and they can make it better. And I think it's ego that sort of stands in the way of, if, if, if yarn's a cool thing and if somebody really wants to make it at UB and, and they can take it out for a spin, um, it'd be great. It'd be great for that to live. I, you know, I, I love Far Cry. I live and breathe Far Cry. I've obviously got something else inside, uh, and and I I thought it was a really cool exercise, and I think it's kind of ignited something different. If you're asking me specifically, you know, how do we make it as big? I don't know, but I'd love to find out. I would love to find out. I think that uh, just working in a place where where this is okay, you know, to, to walk in and be talking about Far Cry, and the next breath be talking about yarn. That's a super cool place, and it's, it's like an idea factory. So Ubisoft as a, as a company, um, unlike some of the other larger publishers, does make things that aren't necessarily going to sell millions. Do you think that there is a danger at the moment that unless something is you know, potentially a, a massive, massive seller, it doesn't get made? How do we balance the need for the you know, multi-million dollar franchises in order to keep a company afloat with smaller games that might have a smaller appeal, but mm -hmm. are nonetheless worth making. I think, it, yes, I think there's a danger. I think that's true. But I think what's really cool is right now, you're looking at the tools for people to be able to make this stuff be really, really accessible for the first time. So, you know, you've got people who are able to make remarkable stuff on the iPhone. You've got people who are able to make remarkable stuff uh, using in-game editors and, and those types of things. It's really, really cool what the players are making. And so I think that... Um, you know, it's good to work at a company that has the spirit that it can make like a little indie project and they can see what happens and a, a thing like Yarn could be pitched. I don't think if I worked at, um, I mean, UB is the type of place where I think it's okay to have these thoughts and then show up and not really tell anybody back there and then pitch it and then see where it goes. I think that's cool. But yeah, I think sometimes the, the industry can be restrictive. Like it's super hard to stand up here and, and, and pitch a game that might not make a lot of money. And, and I, I meant that honestly, is that when I say inspirational, it's something that I struggle with for sure. Uh, I don't want to be hypocritical about this. It, it's super hard to be inspirational all the time. You're in a business, you're working a ton of hours, you've got a ton of responsibility, and it weighs on your chest all the time. Um, but I think it's super cool that we can explore these new things and that there's you know, a better than average chance that it's going to get made. So hopefully it does get made. <laughs> I want to ask, in your role as a producer, um, you obviously work with all sorts of different creatives. Um, from your presentation, it seems to me that you're quite a visual creative thinker. Yep, for sure. What kind of other types of creative thinker do, do you encounter mm. when you're on a big project, and how do you try and accommodate everybody? How do you try and find a way of communication that lets people express themselves it's, in their own way? It's interesting because I think that, you know, the people like, you guys watch Westworld? Yeah. Okay, remember the creative director on Westworld? Right, super cliche, an interesting guy, super cool, but it's like it's. I look at that and it, it hurts a little, um, because I think creative directors come in all shapes and sizes and and have different. Um, you know, there's some some folks who are really quiet and introspective, and they just want to be able to put their music on and they want to be able to write, and they want to be able to to lay out here. Here are my thoughts. Have a read of this and tell me what you think. And there are others that are super emotive and bombastic, and it's just it's just this show, and you kind of drink it in and go, well, I don't know what the hell that, that means, but it sounds amazing, and let's, it's a carnival. <laughs> um, and I think that you got to be prepared to kind of counterpunch about that. It's, I think of it as kind of like dealing with water. It's going to find a way to flow, and you got to figure out a way to channel it. And it's super hard. It's super tough. But if you try and, and apply one aspect of managing it, and I talk about that, you're going to break it. Um, it's creativity as much as I gave the light bulb and the color and the crayons a hard time. It's true. People, they communicate in different ways. And it takes a very special type of producer to be able to leverage that talent and kind of manage it and kind of uh, allow it to grow and even plug the team into it. It's, there's, there's a sun there, and you want to try and use that energy in a productive way without breaking it. It's not easy. No question on the front? Oh, sorry, one second. I think we've got a mic coming for you so everyone can hear. Hi, 
So as a storyteller and a producer, do you feel more satisfaction at the end of a project that you see a response in the audience, that they've completely understood your vision and exactly where you were going, and you can see that in the reactions of Let's Play videos and things like that? Or do you feel more satisfaction if they completely go off piste and make their entire own um, kind of way of understanding the game that completely surprises you? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Can I lie? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, it's so, uh, uh, luckily I've, I've been engaged with that type of question for a while on Far Cry, and I learned that lesson on Far Cry 3. Uh, on Far Cry 3, I absolutely had this prescription for how I imagined people were gonna play the game. Holy shit, was I wrong. And what it does is it, for a minute it breaks you, and you're like, I don't understand, you're not, you're not playing the way the game you're supposed to, and then you hear yourself say that out loud and go, okay, so don't do that again. Uh, the, the game is, and Far Cry in general is this amazing anecdote factory. And the whole idea is to allow the systems to collide. The whole idea is to have stuff that happens that you didn't plan for. And so if you create this prescription for it, you're doing it wrong. Um, give the players the tools to be able to express themselves. Give them the opportunity to be able to author the script and the narrative the way they want. Meeting characters, bringing people in and doing all that stuff. Hiring the guns for hire they want, the fangs for hire they want. Give them all that stuff and allow them to play they want and then just sit back and enjoy it. I would answer that question very differently five years ago. How so? I would just say, no, it's, they gotta play it a certain way. <laughs> and that's not true at all, honestly. Like, the, what's really, really cool now is looking at the tools that we're giving players and seeing the wellspring of new ideas that can come from it. And I think that what we have to do a better job now is providing tools for people to be able to make their own vision and experience that as well. You mentioned the idea in your presentation about the player being in the band now. And is that kind of part of that philosophy for you, the idea of the player being able to um, play something in the way that, that expresses them, yeah. that, that takes part? I, uh, I, the industry is changing, and I, and I really mean that, is that the player is in the band, and, and it's something that I, I think I'm, I, you have to remember every day, right? Because truly, as a creative, it's a, it can be a little bit lonely sometimes. You get locked in your head, and you, and you, you write stuff, or you come up with ideas, and and you communicate them, and, and aspects of the ideas get through. And it's, it's tough to keep going and putting that stuff front and center. And I think that by leveraging the player and allowing the player to be able to play the way they want, I think that, that only makes the, the systems better. It only makes it better for the game and what you're doing with your creative. So it's all about bringing the player in and making them part of the band. I know that sounds a little cheesy. When I say it out loud, it sounds really cheesy. But players are making amazing stuff. And if you're a creative who doesn't look at it, it's, you're, just, you're missing everything. I think we've got time for two more questions. If we have more from the floor. There's one, right? Uh, oh, uh, how do you strike a compromise between your narrative and the game? Because at the end of the day, you're making a game and a story that's not integrated well, isn't going to interest or whatever, but sometimes something on the floor, not even spoken about, will say more than just a tacked on cutscene or something. True, yeah, I think, as, a, as somebody who really cares about narrative and, and sort of thinks that way first, I think it's really hard to know that you're making a game where you may not see some of that. You may choose not to, to imbibe in it. You may choose not to, to do that. But I think we have to be able to allow the player to author the experience the way they want. So it's heartbreaking. You know, there's some really cool missions in, in Far Cry. There's one in particular in Far Cry 5 that's my favorite, but there's a very good chance you're not gonna play it. And it's not because we're not gonna ship it, it's gonna be great, but you just, it's not, it's not an imperative moment in the narrative. It's not, uh, it's not something, it's something that you can discover. And I'm sitting here thinking, how do I, how do I shovel that in? How do I make sure everybody sees it? And the answer is that's not the game we're making. The game we're making is the opportunity for you to go out and meet people. And it has a throughput, it has a spine of this character, this, this dark character and this, this cult. But we also want you to be able to snack. There are action bubbles in the world where you can go and snack on them. And if you don't care for what you're getting there, go snack on something else. The, the way I was explaining it earlier, the way I, I kept thinking about it is like speed dating. And you go and you have a date, you speed date, and then you move on to the next thing. And I think that that snacking, that idea of going around and meeting different characters and deciding whether or not you like them and 
taking in those little stories and then moving on to the next one. What's really going to be interesting is watching people play the game and playing in a, I got to be careful, I'm going to give away stuff here. <laughs> Somebody's going to tackle me from off the side. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting for people to pick up the game with a notion of what they think it is and then play in a region where it's completely different and then communicate about the game and somebody else who's played it a different way go, what are you talking about? And then go and discover it that way. And I, I think you know, it's a tricky thing to build an open world where you can kind of go where you want and do what you want and put it in any order and have the narrative be organic enough to be able to respond to it. But I think, it, I think it's worth it. Narrative and play are often put in opposition. But I think that one of the true challenges of great game design is, is making them work together. Yes, and it's, it's super hard because it's the type of thing that, that, that works only at the end. And so there's a long time where you're like, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Is this going to work? And then when it works, you're like, thank God it's working. So yeah. I think that's time for one more question. A hey, fantastic talk. Um, so speaking to you, the previous point about narrative and how you work that into the game alongside gameplay, I uh, realized that you guys are then looking at a cooperative component to Far Cry 5. How have you found trying to weave that into your narrative and how difficult is that to then? Yeah, it's, it's not easy, right? It's yeah. a, and it, I, would, I would use co-op as another moment in the anecdote factory. It's another system, it's another opportunity. I think the thing that we did to really try and make it so that it felt like it was cohesive was we built the guns for hire system and we built the fangs for hire system and then we built the friend for hire system and we made it all part of one thing. So that you know, it feels like your friend is coming in and playing your game and is part of your experience. But when you add narrative to that, there's no question that some players are just gonna come in and, and they're, you know, for me, I would love that everybody watches every single scene twice. <laughs> and it's not gonna happen. The truth is we put in a skip button we put in the opportunity for you to just go, no, I just want to play the game. I want to go out and I want to have the anecdote factory. But we also put in a little bit of subtlety and nuance. What I always like is when you, know, you think about the social contract you make with somebody when you go up and you have a conversation. You walk up and you have eye contact with them. And then if you walk away, you expect them to get a little pissed off. And then if you come back, you see them stumble over their words. And it feels real when you do that. And so even though it's, it's a realization, even though it, it may not further the agenda of the narrative itself or even the game itself, there's a thing that you want from your, your characters to be able to make it feel like it's real. So you go and you talk to somebody and they look you in the eye, they give you a meaningful piece of information and then if you, if you walk away, they're like, where the fuck are you going? And then if you come back, they're like, okay, seriously, all right, well here. And you know, you're not gonna nail it, it's not gonna be 100%, but, but investing in that and investing in feeling like those characters are real, that's, there's something golden there. I think that is all we have time for on the questions front. I just want to say thank you very much to all of you for coming. And uh, thank you to everyone who watched on the stream. Also, important thank you to BAFTA's partners um, for the game's events, which are Tencent, EA, Sega, Game, and Ubisoft. Uh, BAFTA does lots of events like this all throughout the year. If you want to find out more about them, you can go to BAFTA.org and see the calendar. But most of all, thank you so much to Dan Hay. That was honestly fascinating. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.